I want to start out by wishing everyone a Merry Christmas. Thank you. And I uh, wanted to start with talking a little bit about our first reading from the prophet Isaiah chapter 9. And this is good to remember in case you have Jehovah's Witnesses on your porch and you want to run them off. You point out that it says that Christ, it says a child is born to us who is the God hero, Father forever, Prince of Peace. Well, if you know anything about their theology, they deny that Jesus is God. And they can prove it by showing their, their Bible that is rewritten, changing the words where it references Jesus to be God. But the reality is, is he is the God hero because Christmas is the beginning of a rescue operation to rescue our souls from the grip of eternal death, otherwise known as hell. So Jesus, in order to make the atonement, has to become a man. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why is that? Because the offense, the original sin, is by a man, Adam. And so um, his sin plus our sins on top uh, are made by men. And so uh, a man has to make the atonement. But we can't atone for a sin against an infinite God because we're not infinite. And as long as I'm having fun with Jehovah's Witnesses, I might also mention that angels, like men, have a beginning in time as created by God. And they claim that Jesus is Michael the Archangel being crucified. Now, crucifying an angel, or me for that matter, isn't going to save anybody. However, when God becomes a man and God suffers for our sins, the merits are infinite and they can atone for every sin ever committed from the first to the last throughout the centuries. And so that is how Jesus saves us by paying the debt, the punishment for our sins so that we are freed of that punishment and rescued by the God hero. And so um, when we understand that, we understand a little bit better about the love that Jesus has for us because he gives us his life and sheds his precious blood on the cross for us. And from that sacrifice comes the sacrament, which is the Eucharist. And that is how, along with faith and baptism and obedience and prayer, we become united to Christ and when we become united to Christ, we receive the benefits of every drop of precious blood that was shed for us from the cross. And so it's important that we become united to Christ so that we can enter into heaven free of sin because he has freed us from sin. Now, showing our belief in the divinity of Christ, when we are doing the creed tonight, when it comes to the part about him becoming man, we genuflect according to our physical ability to show respect for this profound doctrine uh, that God becomes a man to atone for us. So if we think about it, so Christmas is a time of giving gifts. Well, what is the great gift that God gave us? His only beloved son. He gave his son for our sins. And that is the primary and the greatest Christmas gift of all is God giving us his son Jesus to sacrifice. Now, Bishop Sheen uh, often said that Jesus was the only man that was born to die. That was his purpose starting out. And so we see hints of that with the myrrh. The myrrh is sort of like uh, embalming fluid. We would never give that to someone as a gift for a baby. That would be pretty creepy. But it's a hint of what what is to come is that this baby Jesus will eventually grow up and give himself in sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And we see, um, we see the myrrh mentioned later on in the scriptures um, at the end for his body, for his uh, sacred body's uh, um, anointing. So when we look at the gifts of God, we say to ourselves, what are, what are we going to give him? Well, he's given us our life. He's given us his life. 
and he hopes to give us another life in eternity. But we need to be connected to him in order to receive those benefits. So um, the thing we need to realize is as long as we are alive and breathing, and we're alive and breathing because he wants us to be, we are capable of receiving redemption, like the good thief. The good thief, uh, he may have waited to the end, but he still made it. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Those are the words we want to hear. Because you know there's another frightening option. Matthew 25, where he says to the goats, depart from me, you accursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That, to me, is one of the scariest lines in Scripture. And we sure don't want to hear that, do we? Now, as I said before, a couple weeks ago, um, we are the judge of our eternal soul. You say, well, Father, I thought God is a judge. Yes, but what, how does God judge us? He judges us on our own decisions. So our final judgment that we will hear at the end of our lives is being made here and now by us. We decide, am I going to pray today? Am I going to obey today? Am I going to, is, have I decided that God is worthy of a significant portion of my life to give him time in prayer? You know, how, where do I put God on the value system of things in my life? And you know, there's, there's the false gospel, you know, of, of money and pleasure and power, but you know, that really doesn't do anything for us. What does something for us is humility, trustworthiness, being a, a faithful servant to the standards of God and doing his will. That's what makes a difference. And so um, that's how we get judged worthy of eternal life at the end of our lives. When we judge God worthy of a place in our life here and now, he will judge us worthy of a place in his kingdom there and then at the end of our lives. So, again, think about it. The judgments you make here and now in this life, they'll come back to you to visit you again. So if you're wondering what God's going to decide, maybe you need to think about what you're deciding here and now. They are intimately connected. Now, one of the significant things for me, I'll, I'll kind of mention, 1977, you know, when you mention that year to the kids, they're like, wow, that was when the year the dinosaurs were alive. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I didn't, I didn't take Rover for a walk. I took T-Rex out. You know, we headed down to Jurassic Park. It was ancient. We had a 19-inch zenith, uh, black and white, from most of my life, with little rabbit ears that got a couple of signals out of, out of New York City. You know, that was TV. So, um, now nowadays, you know, we have, we have the benefit of the internet, which can go two ways. It can go for evil or good, but um, Prager University has some really great videos showing the reasons for the existence of God. So if you want to, you can type that in, Prager University uh, proofs for the existence of God. I think you'll find they have some amazing things on there, under five minutes, well-illustrated, well-spoken people on, on the videos, and they deal with the questions about God and science and this and that. And there's a lot of political stuff too, but that's, I'm not gonna push that. It's in there with the other stuff, but the, the stuff, the basic stuff about God and the basic questions about God's existence and things like that, he deals with that pretty good. Now, when, in 1977, that was the year that changed my life. That was the year of, in a sense, rebirth. So there's a spiritual connection for me with Christmas because that was the beginning of changing my life. Now, I love to watch Scrooge because, you know, Scrooge is a kind of a spiritual thing connected with Christmas where the ghost of Christmas past shows him where he was. The ghost of Christmas present shows where he is now. The ghost of of Christmas yet to come shows him where he's going and he sees the grave and that's that's when he finally gets the push he needs to straighten out and it's funny you know they kick Scrooge and Charlie Brown out of the public schools because of the references to God imagine that 
Charlie Brown's so dangerous, you know. Linus reads from the Gospel of Luke, which we just read from, about the birth of Christ. And, you know, we can't have that in the public schools. We can't have the kids hearing about God, you know. So, uh, or, or um, you know, uh, the, the Scrooge has a couple of references. I think Marley's Ghost talks about the star of Bethlehem in there. And, and, and so, you know, what happens when you kick God out of public schools? They, they took the prayer out of public schools in the early 60s. Well, you kick God out, it doesn't take long before the devil shows up. So we have all these shootings and things like that and craziness. And, and they're like, what has happened to society? Society has rejected God. That's what's happened. And so it's, it, it's a sad thing. But we as individuals can decide ourselves. Do we want to accept God or reject him? So in 1977, my dad gave me a Bible for Christmas, and I began to read that. And then he gave me a Miraculous Medal. And the Miraculous Medal is one of the best deals going. I have one right here, just to, for inspiration for me. And um, uh, the Miraculous Medal, when Mary appeared to St. Catherine La in 1830, she promised that those who would wear it would receive great graces. It's to be blessed by a priest and worn around the neck. And so I have this gift for you after Mass. I have two uh, brown bowls, wooden bowls, uh, which I'll take out of my office and put out. One is filled with blessed, miraculous medals, and one is filled with chains to go with the medals. And I have a few St. Benedict medal finger rosaries left for anyone that might want those as well. So that's going to be my Christmas gift to you this year. But I, I wore the medal. And it really wasn't even two months after starting to wear the medal that I picked up the rosary on my mother's dresser and I began to pray it. I don't even know why, I just remember I did it. And I'm pretty sure it has to do with my mother's prayers and my spiritual mother's prayers, which is the Blessed Mother, and the medal that my dad gave me. And so Mary promised great graces to those who wear it. And well, I got some graces to want to pray the rosary and it changed my whole life. Without those things, without that rosary, and that miraculous medal, I wouldn't be here today. I don't know what I'd be doing for a living, but I sure wouldn't be a priest. So um, I'm happy to give that to you after Mass. We have our main stained glass one in the front is actually a big miraculous medal. So the church wears a miraculous medal in a sense. So that's, that's kind of nice. And the beautiful prayer, O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us who have recourse to thee or who turn to you. Um, so those great prayers, those powerful prayers of the highest saint in heaven, Mary praying for us and with us. And when we wear the medal, we have the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which is on the medal, and the Immaculate Heart of Mary over our hearts. There's a cross on the medal. And so there's <coughs> beautiful blessings um, awaiting for you. So I hope you'll give the medal a chance. Again, it could be a, a, a new beginning for you. The Christmas should be a time of spiritual renewal. It was for, it was for Scrooge. It was for me. And maybe it can be for you. So the whole point of Christmas is Jesus is born to save us from sin. And so um, we take these gifts that God gives us from heaven, like the miraculous medal and the rosary and the Bible. And I, I'm a firm believer in sacramentals, you know, crucifixes, things like that. Um, the Bible itself is a sacramental. So, so these, these gifts that God gives us from heaven, along with his own beloved son, are things that help us to be with him forever in heaven. So let's do our best to take the gifts from heaven, recognize them and their value, that they are given by God himself, the one who gave us life, this body, this soul, to help us on, onto the stairway to heaven.